Greetings everyone, my name is Jonathan Bailey, I'm from the website Plagiarism Today, which can be found at plagiarismtoday.com, and today I want to talk about the Capitol Records v. Vimeo lawsuit. Now a couple of you have asked me to go over the Oracle v. Google case, I am doing that as one of the upcoming videos. However, we've had a major ruling in this case that could have a potential impact, or rather non-impact, on YouTube, so it's worthwhile to take a moment, go through this case, understand how it came about, sort of how we got into this mess, and then why YouTube could have been so deeply impacted by this ruling. So first off, let's take a look at the two um, parties in this lawsuit. First, we have Capitol Records. Now, Capitol Records, of course, was a record label launched in 1942, and it's actually a little unfair to call this Capitol Records v. Vimeo, because if you look at the litigation, it's actually a bunch of record labels, all underneath the EMI flagship. Um, <clears throat> that are suing Vimeo. So realistically, if we were going to be in a fair universe, it'd be EMI v. Vimeo, but yeah, uh, Capitol Records is the lead plaintiff, so it's Capitol Records v. Vimeo. That's just how it is. And Vimeo, as you probably know, is the user-generated video site best known for not being YouTube. Okay, that's unfair, but the point of the matter is it's a user-generated video site that is not as popular as YouTube yet. It's actually doing quite well for itself, but it gets targeted a lot for litigation like this simply because it doesn't have the big arm of Google backing it up. Now, the lawsuit actually centered over users who had uploaded various um, Capitol Records and other EMI tracks to Vimeo. And the question at hand was, was Vimeo responsible for the infringement? Now, the most recent ruling said no, but we have to get, sort of understand why there were some serious questions about this. And our journey through this actually begins way, way back in 1909. Why 1909? Well, before the Copyright Act in 1976, this was the Copyright Act that ruled the land in the United States. And it actually had several key differences from the current Copyright Act. We're still under the Copyright Act in 1976, for the record. It had several key differences. Um, the big one for our intents and purposes today was that if you were, if you had invented a new type of technology sometime between 1909 and 1976 and you wanted it to be copyright protected, you wanted the works created in that means to be copyright protected, you had two options. One, you had to get Congress to go forth and write you an act that said it was copyright protected or you could go and convince the Copyright Office that it fell under one of the existing categories. That's because the Copyright Act specifically listed the items that were copyright protected with the current act basically says anything that meets these qualifications is copyright protected. That seems like a very, very minor deal, but think about this. In the 1960s, computer programmers had to go to the Copyright Office and convince them that computer programs were worthy of copyright protection. It actually took a lot of work. But the big area for our purpose today is sound recordings. In 1909, when that act was passed, sound recordings were fairly rare. And so they were not explicitly included in that act, which creates a pretty big problem because, you know, sound recordings went on to become a kind of a big thing. I don't know if you noticed. Um, so what ended up happening was in 1971, there was the Sound Recording Amendment of 1971. What this basically was a response to was the rise in home taping and piracy of records, tapes, and other types of sound recording um, devices. Long and short of it is this act put sound recordings under federal copyright, because that's an important point to note here. Is prior to this amendment, it isn't that sound recordings were public domain. The Copyright Act in 1909 also allowed for states to have their own various levels of copyright protection. So, sound recordings, instead of being protected under federal copyright, were protected under state and common law copyright, which is a very, very bizarre thing, and it provides some different protection, so to speak. Now, <clears throat> I don't mentioned Sound Recording Act in 1971. It took effect February 15, 1972, so you might be saying, yay, job done, congratulations, go team, we solved this one. Yeah, no, we didn't. Um, the reason being that that act was not retroactive. It didn't take any previously created works before 1972 and put them under federal copyright protection. Instead, it only worked on, mo on works moving forward. So if you fixed a work into a tangible medium of expression, basically you saved your audio file after February 15, 1972, federal copyright protection. Day before, state common law. Very, very, very bizarre situation here. Now, the next law we have to take a quick look at is, of course, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act of 1998. 
This law, as we know, has multiple parts, but the key part here is that it provides a safe harbor to hosts such as YouTube and Vimeo um, when their users engage in infringing activities. For example, if you were to upload an infringing video right now, YouTube would not be liable so long as they remove that video expeditiously upon notification, blah, blah, blah. We know a lot of this already, I believe. But there's an interesting question here that all of a sudden comes up. The DMCA is a federal act. Pre-1972 sound recordings, as we just discussed, are not federally protected. Does the DMCA cover pre-1972 sound recordings? The potential implications here are huge. One of the intents of the DMCA was to prevent hosting providers from having to go through and filter content or otherwise proactively edit and remove material. Well. If, they're not, if the DMCA doesn't protect them with pre-1972 sound recordings, they could be forced to either not allow the upload of sound recordings or do exactly that. So thus, we have our lawsuit. Capitol Records et al. I love that. It's a very lengthy, as you'll see in just a second, actually. It's a very lengthy list of plaintiffs there. V. Vimeo, a.k.a. Vimeo.com. <laughs> The lawsuit, like I said, centered around a bunch of, something like a hundred, over, well over a hundred videos, which were uploaded to Vimeo containing, five, containing sound recordings copyrighted by Capitol Records and the other plaintiffs. And one of the claims were made were that the ones done pre-1972 were not covered underneath the DMCA, so therefore Vimeo should not enjoy that safe harbor protection. Well, in the initial court, the lower court rather, agreed with Capitol Records and its, uh, and its uh, pl co plaintiffs there. And that put everyone kind of in a bind. Where's this going to go? Are we going to have to filter these songs out? Are we going to be more proactive? I mean, YouTube has content ID, so it already does some degree of proactive filtering, but new sites like Vimeo do not. Is this something that's going to have to happen? Tough question. Well, but, well, the, the issue was eventually appealed to the Second Circuit, and there's your uh, full link, full list of plaintiffs, as you can see. And the Second Circuit basically overturned the lower court decision, ruling that the obvious intent of Congress was to not have um, hosting providers like Vimeo be forced to filter out and otherwise proactively edit and, and, re and eliminate these types of infringements. And therefore, it's obvious in their mind that Congress intended to make it apply to pre-1972 sound recordings. Now, this is something you see a lot in courts, because there's a lot of times that laws are not particularly clear. And so when judges have to go through and do an analysis of this, what they end up doing is trying to go to the sort of the... Uh, the history of the bill. They try to look at what Congress was saying when they were working on passing it, and they figure out the intent of the legislation. They try to figure out what they were trying to accomplish and make sure that their rulings fit what they were intending to do. All in all, it's a pretty interesting bill, and the, the, where we sit right now with this is straightforward. There's no change. Thanks to this particular ruling here in the Second Circuit, we absolutely have no change in the law right now. YouTube has to take no additional action. Vimeo has to take no additional action. Everyone's okay. But this obviously could be appealed to the Supreme Court. Obviously, we could see a different ruling in a different circuit. Obviously, this may not be the end of this particular issue. And the reason is simple. Pre-1972 sound recordings have created a mess in the law. They really, really have. And let me give you a good example here. We'll go back to that uh, act of nine, that, that was sound recording amendment in 1971. Remember how I mentioned it was targeted at piracy? Well, one thing it didn't do when it federalized, um, when it federalized um, post-1972 sound recordings was it didn't grant them a performance right. Because of that, radio stations and so forth don't pay a royalty to musicians when they play their songs. Now, that seems kind of crazy, especially considering a few years later, well, not a few years, a few decades later, in the 1990s, there was an act passed granting a performance right when sound recordings are played over digital mediums. So Pandora, Spotify, um, even Sirius XM and so forth all do have to pay a royalty for post-1972 sound recordings. But there was a serious question why they had to pay them for pre-1972 sound recordings. This is what happens when you get two separate classifications of copyright. You get a mess on your hands. And for the record, a lot of this stuff, as with the Vimeo lawsuit, started when several litigants came forward and actually challenged SiriusXM and others for not paying royalties for pre-1972 sound recordings 
and won, and they ruled that under at least some states' copyright laws, under some states' common laws, should say there is a performance right for sound recordings. What does this mean? Well, it could mean some disastrous things for, for some interesting, I shouldn't say completely disastrous, it depends on how it's applied, but some, some changes for radio, because pre-1972 sound recordings could have could be owed royalties from terrestrial radio even though they're not owed from post-1972. It's a bizarre mess. And honestly, the best solution to this in the end is going to be federalization of pre-1972 sound recordings. But there's been a lot of reluctance on that because A, it's kind of difficult now. I mean, it's we've been, you know, in the, this era now for some for, for 40 years pretty much, for 45 years. It's going to be tough to do it. And the second part of the problem is that there's a lot of pushback against it because some of the rights holders who hold a lot of those rights to pre-1972 sound recordings actually enjoy and prefer their state common law protection for various reasons, one of them being that aforementioned performance right. So yeah, we have a mess on our hands. Hopefully we can work this one out. But in the meantime, the good news is YouTube has no changes coming forth to it. There is no need for it to worry about having to proactively edit or remove works even though it does so already with content ID, like I said, it could have been a huge mess on their hands and for them and for other video sites and audio sites like SoundCloud. Well, that's all I have for right now. Thank you very much for joining us, and until next time, this is Jonathan Bailey, signing off.